Lord, you are holy. Lord, help that to be not something we say to manipulate you, to appease you, to get you to to go to work for us, to have some type of transaction. We worship and, and you answer our prayers. But Lord, help us to enter into that very holy place you've placed within us. And it's holy not because it exists, but because you're there. You've chosen to dwell there. Your spirit within us is holy. And it cries holy within us. So Lord, help us to be in touch with that this morning, that place, that relationship of holiness. Not only as we preach, Lord, but as we hear. And not only as we hear, but as we hear from you, regardless of the words that come out of these lips. And that the spirit response within us is yes and amen. I was listening to a podcast on the uh, way here on Wednesday. And this is, uh, this is by a naturalist. He, he would say he's an atheist, but he wouldn't really make a big deal about being an atheist. He's not really like atheist against something. He just believes biology is the, the sum, pretty much the sum total of the human ex- existence. Uh, so he's always saying we have, we're having a biological experience. But he has it had a very interesting conversation with someone. They were talking about all the algorithms that are out there to stir up anger within people. You know, it's what you're, and it's all about getting clicks. So it says, oh, you clicked on that. You, that, that stirred you up a little bit. Let's feed you some more of that. Click, click, click. Oh, you know, that, let's stir it up. So we have right against left, left against right. We have Gen Z's against boomers, boomers against Gen Z's. And, you know, uh, all, the, all the evils with the boomers and all the laziness with the Gen Z's. And it's just a, a click, 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 you know, just stir it up. Let's stir up the pot, get, get bigger market share. Uh, it's eroding it's eroding our common sense of community and um, connectedness. Not eat really, not with the intention of destroying it, just the, in, the intention of increasing market shares. It's just, it's just foolishness growing out of control. And now we're, we're bringing AI so we can do it even better. Um, so Carl warned us of the righteous anger, right, that... Uh, when he preached uh, several weeks ago, that this stirring up, this righteousness, I'm going to put righteousness in quotes, it, it just blinds, blinded to the situation around us. It's blinded to the holiness of God, and it demonizes those on the other side in whom we're stirring the pot. And we feel we, feel we have the justified by God or the universe or humanity or whatever virtues we're proclaiming to go and attack and and destroy those on the other side of the line. If your soul is not at rest, you had a lot of people working very hard to stir it up. I just, I just, I want you to give some grace to yourself this morning. It's in the air we breathe. It's in the airwaves. (laughs) We're eating, we're breathing, we're clicking in. Um, it's set up to stir you up. So to not get caught up in that, to not get swept away with that, requires a lot of intentionality, a lot of intentionality. Uh, Whether you're religious or non-religious, it just requires a lot of intentionality. Um, Peter's been admonishing, admonishing us to get into the van, that God is taking someplace wonderful. Um, and he talks about, uh, been talking about as we go through Second Peter, that Second Peter was in Jerusalem. He knows they're they're about to crucify him. They're saying, "Peter, escape! You have a word of knowledge. Let's go." So Peter's heading out of Rome to to save his life. God has revealed this to him, and as he's going out, tradition says, in the vision, he sees Jesus going into Rome, and Peter turns around and, and goes back into the Rome to be crucified. Uh, He's done fleeing. He's ready to follow Jesus wherever Jesus would lead. 
He remembers those words, Peter, when you were a young man, you went where you wanted to go. But when you're older, another will tie it, will bind you and take you where you don't want to go. But he wasn't bound by Rome. <laughs> he was bound by his love for the Lord to be with him where he is. <sighs> Jesus didn't suffer so that we don't have to. Jesus suffered to enter into our suffering, to redeem it, to set us free from our fear of suffering. Yeah, we'll just leave it there. So Brett did a beautiful job of drawing from Pulp Fiction. Uh, I don't know where that is in the Bible, but it's got to be somewhere. Um, and this whole sense of struggling through this paradigm of God's doing something here. And I, I, love, I love the image of the puppy. Uh, that, yeah, for those who don't have puppies, they think, oh, it was a puppy. For those who do, it's like, oh, a puppy. So, the puppies are a lot of work. They, they, they don't follow. They don't listen. They chew things up. They get into what they're not supposed to. They won't follow on a leash. They're pulling ahead or you're dragging them behind. And then the, he talked about the dog whisperer. So it's like understanding the language of the dog and what the dog needs to understand. The dog wants to please you. So how do, how do you speak dog <laughs> to, to where the dog is happy and content to be beside you, to walk alongside you? And that this is what the, the Lord is doing with us to go from... Puppies pulling at the leash and being distracted by every, everything, every squirrel, every flower that comes by, every dandelion, and to be a faithful companion to walk the earth with. That this is the relationship God is calling us into. I'll recap briefly the sermon I did from Enter the Garden. I said we were going to be uh, attentive to three questions. One is, um, why did Jesus have habits, holy habits, and why do we need them? Um, so that we can develop a quiet and attentive soul uh, that's attentive to the presence and action of Jesus within us, to walk with him, to walk the earth with him as we do life together. And why did Jesus pray, do not enter into temptation? It's because when God has purpose, plans and purposes for our lives, the false self will try to fulfill those purposes to make itself great. It'll use the very promises of God and then try to fulfill them in its own strength. And it will leave havoc in its wake. And we're going we're gonna to unpack that a little bit today. Um, but that, that unpacking isn't, I don't want you feeling bad about the false self. I want, you to, I want you to invite it into something deeper. And then finally, what was in the cup? Um, the cup is the very life of God's union with us, poured into our mortal body our mortal souls. Immortality is poured into mortality. The infinite is poured into the very, very finite, uh, ransoming us free from captivity to sin, death, and hell by filling it, filling us with the very life of the divine presence of God. And then yesterday morning during our Lenten offering, uh, we sat a little time with Psalm 131. And I'd like us to do that now because that's where this, this sermon this morning sprang out of. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Just have this picture of a wean child, not a not a nursing babe, who was with tyrannical cries to be fed, but an older child that comes to its mother not for milk, 
but just to be in her presence, the warmth of her embrace. To lay your head against her chest, to lay your head in her lap. As she strokes your hair, perhaps sitting in silence, perhaps singing over you, perhaps reading. This is a good place to be. This is the Lord's invitation to us to still our soul, to quiet and calm our soul, and relax in his presence. All will be well. All manner of thing will be well. For I am with you, and I am in you. And then, because I was preaching, I left that place and thought of Israel. Not Israel the nation, but the man. This is not a political sermon on pro-Zionism or anti-Semitism. I'm not going there, so you can relax, let that go. Um, sure, that would develop clicks, but you know, just, yeah. But I want, to, I want to approach the life of Jacob as a cautionary tale um, of trying to fulfill the promises of God through human effort. That's the, always the temptation in the garden when we don't watch and pray, is to try to fulfill the promises of God through human means, human strength, human cunning, human might, human coercion. And still... God's mercy and patience and faithfulness to walk to earth with us through the mess that we make. So to put this in place, this is, this is Jacob. This is before the law of Moses. This is before Jesus. <laughs> it's before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's before Moses and the law. All of that. It's before there was a nation Israel. This is, a, this is a, a tribal family, and dad has a tribal God, and dad's, dad Isaac, Father Isaac, seems to be getting some favor from this tribal God. And dad Isaac has a favorite son. It's the older twin brother, Esau, not Jacob. Jacob is mama's favorite. So Isaac is blind, and his life is fading. Rebecca, Isaac's wife, Jacob's mother, concocts a scheme for Jacob, the younger twin, to receive the blessing of Esau, the older twin, the secret sauce of spiritual power and authority that seems to bless the life of Isaac. So they succeed. They, fool, they pull one over on the old man, and they, they pull it off. Jacob gets Isaac's blessing. Isaac thinks he's blessing Esau, and he's really blessing Jacob. But they're just... What I have said, I have said. It, it must stand. Um, and then Esau wants to kill Jacob. So Rebecca concocts another scheme to manipulate Isaac uh, into sending Jacob to live with her brother to seek a wife. Now she comes up with the story, I can't stand these Hittite women. Please, you know what? I, I, my life will be miserable. We'll be living hell if, I have, if he marries a Hittite woman. Isaac, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And here she's drawing from a playbook from my Greek fat wedding. You know, the man is the head. He makes the decisions. But the woman is the neck that turns the head. And Isaac says, send him to your brother Laban to take a wife from one of his daughters. So off Jacob goes. Now it occurred to me this morning, maybe... She was also manipulating Jacob to take a wife from there as well. That woman's a mastermind. Um, but anyway, he's on his way. Jacob, uh, and we'll go for Genesis 28. I'll just, I'll read it here. So, genu genuate? Genesis 28, 10 through 17. 
Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Okay, he's traveling, he's camping out under the stars. Um, He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, and its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. That's quite a dream. This isn't a man seeking God. This is a man who just pulled one over on his father, swindled his brother's birthright, and I was fleeing for his wife, for his life in search of a wife. God is not on his mind. And there above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of, and the God of Isaac, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from a sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Now, have you ever been to a place where it seemed like the veil between this world and the next grew thin? And you felt in the presence of God and that fear of like, oh, I'm about to be undone. This mortal flesh can't handle that much of the spiritual realm. Just like uh, standing before the Grand Canyon for the first time and you get up to the edge and this expanse above you and it just kind of feels like gravity's pulling you, pulling you in so you have to back away. Um, That there's both this fascination and desire to draw close, and there's this fear of, that's a live wire. I dare not, I dare not touch it. And we receive a promise. And how quickly our awe and wonder at the revealed majesty of God. I mean, he he saw angels ascending and descending from heaven, to and coming to and from earth. The Lord God Almighty speaking to him, standing above him. Some translations, it could also be set since beside him. So whether it's above him or beside him or both. How quickly he went from looking, I'm in the presence of God, to what's in the promise? He has a a gift for me. I want what's in the box. I mean, if Jesus were to, to suddenly appear right now and he had a box in his hand, would you really be wondering what was in the box? Or would you be looking at him? Would you be desired to be for the Lord? Jacob's desire was for what's in the box. There must be something special about this place. It's not that the Lord is present everywhere, but if I get in the right place, if I find the fount where the glory comes out, then, then I can receive blessing. I know where to come for blessing when I run dry. So the next morning, early the next morning, Jacob took the stone and he, that he had placed under his head and he set up a pillar, you know, a standing stone. That's what ancient peoples did. They set up standing stones and poured oil on top of it. And he called this place Bethel, though the place used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking. He watch me over on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then, if the Lord does all these things, then the Lord God will be my God. He won't just be the God of Abraham and Isaac, my father and my grandfather. 
Then he will be my God if he does these things for me. And this stone that I have set up will be, as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So let's, let's forgive Jacob, give him some slack for turning this into a transactional deal with the divine shark tank. <sighs> You know, sharks, I'll give you 10% of, of all my enterprise if you'll get behind me in blessing and make these things happen. But you're a silent partner in this. Here's, here's a pillar. That's your house right there. So I know where to come find you. And I'm going to go off over here. And I, ex- I expect your blessing to go with me. I don't want it wearing off too fast. But if it wears off, I want, I want to know where I can come back and, and you know, get a fresh touch, get a fresh anointing, get a fresh promise. And if you do that, I'll give you 10%. I mean, that's, that's the going rate for vassals and overlords in, in the ancient Near East, 10%. You know, you got two armies and one's much bigger than the other. The smaller army says, I give you a 10th. That's kind of how we keep peace. Instead of going to war, we just show up with the big army and well, okay, I'll submit to you. Here's a tenth. So I'll, I, I'll admit, I'll give you a tenth. Now, on, to Jacob's credit, when he gives his word, he means it. He's not going to go searching for a better deal elsewhere. He's not going to go searching for a more powerful God elsewhere. He says, yeah, you're, you're the real deal. I, I want you on my side. I want your fresh anointing. I want your power. So, let's, you know, do we have a deal? So like you, like me, Jacob does not understand his own journey. He's turned the very visitation of the presence of God into a transaction. Oh, Jacob, what, what, what more were you invited into that you just passed up? Like Esau, he did not value his own birthright. Jacob does not value the presence of God for the gift of God himself. But he bargains with God. He's trying to, how do I flatter and manipulate him? And throughout Jacob's journey, God keeps showing up and Jacob will rename this place after God. You know, oh, I guess he wasn't just here at this one standing stone, this Bethel, this house of God. He was also here and then he met me over there. And then finally he comes to a point where after all kinds of, uh, what, what's the um, soap opera, of a soap opera life with Laban and, and then going back, he's finally going back with his family and his wives to, and his, his men and his riches back to return to the house of his father Isaac and he knows he's going to run into Esau. And uh, so he's, he's, he's up there. He's, he split his family in the two camps. In case one gets wiped out, the other half will live. And he keeps giving bit, uh, gifts to Isaac and people going before him to appease Isaac, to appease Isaac's wrath and saying, yes, your, your servant Isaac is coming and he, he has gifts for you, Esau. He's, he's bowing before you. He's bowing before you. But, but then the stranger shows up in camp and it's a, it's a heavenly visitor. And he, uh, Jacob wrestles with him and uh, he wrestles with him all night. And, you know, that's just like God with us, right? You wrestle with your kids, you let them win, you know, kind of get in there because uh, you're bonding with them, you know, in their language, right? They want to they wrestle. Uh, I loved wrestling with my boys when they were young. Uh, they got to a certain age where uh, he was about eight and he, he took a flying leap off the couch and landed on my back. And I was like, yeah, we've got to set some boundaries here. Uh, <laughs> it's getting a little rough. Uh, but even into their teens, we love to wrestle, but they learned uh, they can't be too, too rough on dad when they're ganging up on me because I can't protect myself as fully when I'm taking them two on at the same time. But anyway, Esau wrestles with God, and God lets, God lets, excuse me, Jacob wrestles with God. God lets him prevail. And he changes his name from Jacob to Israel as one who contended with man and God. Jacob was one who supplants, one who grasps. He was grasping for Esau's birthright. And now God says, well, now you're Israel. Um, 
but Israel still wrestling with God. He's still trying to force God to give him a blessing, or maybe he's trying to impress God, whatever it is. But he was also standing between kind of protecting his tribe from God. He was, he was kind of standing in the gap, and I think God really admired that um, as well. It's like, wow, you're, you have this, you, don't, you think you know how to appease me and control me, but you also know you're not really in control here, and yet you're going to try to go toe-to-toe with me. Um, and I just totally went off my notes. Uh, so he doesn't understand his own journey, but basically it's like, if you will bless me and, and this list of stuff that I have, um, then you will be my God. I will, I will even set up the stone for your house. I'll pour some oil on it. Now it's official. Um, stay here. I'll be back for another blessing when I need it. So Jacob's journey is not truly from Beersheba to Haran to seek a wife and escape Isaac. His journey is going, be, is going from one who supplants, one who grasps what another has, that, that he envies. He envies Esau's relationship with his father. He envies Esau's birthright that will be his someday. And he concocts a scheme to take it. He dupes his father, betrays his brother, and wrestles with God to be blessed. Thinking he knows how to successfully manipulate <laughs> God into getting him what he wants. But out of this very flawed man, Israel, will arise a nation. And out of that nation will arise a Messiah, a true son of God, the very image of the Father, the faithful one who does not try to manipulate God, does not try to grasp equality with God, but says, not my will, but thine be done. On earth as it is in heaven. The Messiah who will not only receive the divine blessing for himself, and not only for all the children of Israel, but also all the children of Esau. All the children of Adam and Eve, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The journey is from Jacob wrestling the blessings of his brother to Israel wrestling the blessings from God to a nation that becomes captive to the surrounding superpowers, Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, Rome, and Greece prior to Rome, to a nation captive seeking political and military liberation, to a nation that experiences Emmanuel, God with us. To Yeshua, God is salvation. The journey is one of from men seeking the blessing of God as the means to fill the earth with their offspring, to become wealthy, healthy, and wise, to God giving his very self, seeking to transform all the offspring of earth into the bride of Christ with whom he desires to share all things created by him and for him. Our journey is one from self, self-seeking promises of God. I love God for what God will do for me. Seeking a land flowing with milk and honey and prosperity. To setting our head upon the stone of the gospel. Emmanuel, God with us. Yeshua, God is salvation. Not for knowledge of good and evil of how to save ourselves. Not for knowledge of good and evil of how to manipulate God, how to do a deal with God, how to pay off our sin debt. But the true debt of what God is owed, loving obedience, family, fidelity, and relationship of a true son, Jesus. 
And Jesus, God with us, God is salvation, brings us into his life. And this is eternal life, that we would know him, not just about him, not just from, not just from what my father, Abraham, grandfather Abraham and father Isaac said, not just from what the, the church father said in this, not just what comes down through our Western tradition of, of Catholicism and evangelicalism and Protestantism, but to know firsthand experiential knowledge of the presence of Christ in us. This is eternal life, that they may know the Father and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Like Jesus, make it your custom to enter the garden, to calm and quiet your soul, to still your soul, like a child resting its head in its mother's lap. Let striving for milk cease. Let striving for blessings cease. Let striving for miracles cease. Let striving for power cease. Let striving for authority cease. Let striving for dominion cease. Let striving for knowledge cease. But resting in the presence of God. He knows what you need. And he gives them freely, abundantly, exceedingly, beyond what you could ever ask. He also knows what you don't need, what's too soon, too early, too much, what you'll just use through the false self to manipulate the authority and dominion and power of the kingdom of God for your own needs. We are not seeking for Bethel, the place, the pillar of the house of God where we come and refill I refill my anointing cup and then carry with me. But becoming attentive to Emmanuel, God's presence within me. Drinking from the cup that he drinks from. We're not building a temple, but giving consent for God to continually fill and transform this heart of stone into the lap of God, the temple of God, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. But I want, I want, I need, I need. Shh, be still my soul. Take a breath. Let striving cease. The Lord already knows what you need. The Father already knows what you need. Come into the presence of Abba. The false self is a tyrannical infant. Become a weaned child, not seeking milk, but presence. Adam and Eve, let strivings to steal from the tree of God cease. Cherish walking with him in the garden. Jacob, let striving to bargain with God cease. Striving to receive more and more blessing. Let it cease. Israel, yield to God. Not your will, but his, his be done. Speak to my false self. Emmanuel, God with us is enough. You're not alone. You're not al- I know you're doing the best you can. Try to keep all this safe and together. But you're not alone. Shh. Lay your head against the Lord. We rest in your presence. Yeshua, God is salvation. We rest in your presence. So know your journey. Jesus, Son of God, Savior of the world, the Messiah of God, the eternal Word of God in human flesh, the only begotten Son of the Heavenly Father, the one who willingly entered in the full union, union with all humanity, descending into our condition, our sin, our death, our hell, our spiritual captivity, and filled death, filled that anti-life, filled the outer darkness with the true light and true life of God. The very presence of God uh, turns death into resurrection and shining in outer darkness with a divine light 
that the darkness cannot overcome. No matter how far we venture into outer darkness, we are never beyond the light of Christ beckoning us to turn, receive him, and to be saved. Jesus, God is salvation. Emmanuel, God is with us. Salvation is not a plan to escape the justice of God. It's not some legal trickery. Salvation is the judgment of God to have full union with us, a judgment that was made before the foundation of the world in a Christ who was crucified from the foundation of the world, crucified to pour himself out into his creation to become one with us, God with us, where all humanity becomes the bride of Christ. Thorn by thorn, he plucks this out of our soul, the false self. He heals it inch by inch, converting stone of, a heart of stone into a heart of flesh, a heart set on material things into a heart set on first spiritual consolations and then from spiritual joy, peace, I want, these are things I want, to God himself, even if God brings, walks into suffering. Now I desire to leave the peace and joy behind and walk into suffering with him. That is, that is the spiritual transformation that God takes us on. That was the journey of Peter. To go where he would not have chosen to go as a younger man, back to Rome to be crucified. That the Lord's blood himself is pouring through us. In us. So I'd like this morning to spend a little time in this place. We are in the presence of God Almighty. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, Yeshua, God is salvation. Let's invite you to close your eyes and to breathe in the reality of that. Jesus, you're always revealing the Father, the I am. What are you saying to each of us right now? I'm going to invite you, if you have an inkling, it's not asking for prophetic, a prophetic uh, certitude, but an inkling of the presence of God of what the Spirit is saying within you. And I invite you to borrow words from Scripture, maybe a song you know, of proclaiming the I am is revealing in you of who he is. I am your way. I am your truth. I am your life. I am your peace. I am your healing. I am your true purpose in life. I am the resurrection. I am the one who enters into your death. I am the one who rescues you from sin. I am the one who rescues you from being alone. I am your inheritance. I am the firstborn from the dead. I am the second Adam, a life-giving spirit. I am the one who goes before you I am the one guarding behind you. I am the one walking by your side. I am the one living in you, with you, through you. 
child, you are mine. Rest your head upon me. Calm and quiet your soul. Become attentive to my presence. I invite you to speak out. That's the most important part of this entire sermon. What is the Lord saying to you? I am the deepest desire of your heart. God is so much that there is no other. As a weaned child, I know that godliness with contentment is great gain. I am. I am with you. I am with you always. God with us. God is salvation. This is not a stone pillar that this is the house of God. Stay here, Lord. We'll, we'll come back when we need a refill. This is the life of God poured out into us that we could share in his life as he shares in our death. That we could share in his righteousness as he shares in our broken humanity, our sinful humanity. That we can share in, our, in his faithfulness as he shares in our faithlessness. He joins it all to himself. He heals it from the inside out. He overcomes death not with more death, but with resurrection power. He overcomes outer darkness, not by making it permanent, but by going into it and seeking us, whispering to us until we turn and face him and see him as he truly is. And seeing him, we are transformed into his image and likeness. So Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, as we all betray him, is our nature. And knowing this, he gives himself. He breaks the bread and he says, take, eat this, all of you. He takes the cup. This is the wine of the new covenant in my blood. Drink you all of it. It is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins.
We do not limit his presence to the cup. But we experience his presence in the drinking of the cup. We don't say, Lord, just let this be your house and we'll come back when we need a refill. But I've calmed and quiet my soul so that I'm drinking with you and eating with you wherever I go, wherever we go together, Lord. You're there with me, living life in me, with me, and through me. So I invite you to come to the table. Uh, the blue cups are juice. The brown cups are wine. And in them both, we experience the presence, the real presence of God. The real presence of God is in us. The real presence of God is among us. So come, partake in the feast. Lord, you are the song I sing. Not to you, but you are the song itself singing in me. It is our pleasure to let our lips, let our lungs turn that, to vocalize that song, to let our lives put flesh to that song, to be quiet and hear the Spirit singing the song with us and then with the Spirit to join in to the great chorus. Be calm, my soul. Be quiet. Hear the song of the Lord, who is your life, transforming you into his very image. Jesus is the gospel, his presence with us that will never leave us is the gospel. Breathing in, breath by breath, day by day, year by year season by season, for all eternity. Amen.